When we scan through the bookshelves in the fantasy, horror, sci-fi, or detective fiction section, or a local store, library, or our own bookshelves, we know each of those genres has debts to past writers, fantasy has debts going back to Spencer's Renaissance the Fairy Queen, and Chaucer before that, and what would horror be like without Matthew Lewis's 1796 gothic tale The Monk, and Radcliffe's The Mysteries of Udolpho, the whole genre of horror would lag without that June 16th, 1816 evening at the Villa Diodati on Lake Geneva when Lord Byron, John Polidori, Percy Shelley, Claire Claremont, and a teenage Mary Shelley each agreed to write the spookiest tale they could manage. John Polidori writes Vampire, and that was published in 1819, long, long before Dracula. Percy Shelley writes a fragment of a ghost story, but Mary Shelley writes perhaps the greatest work of horror ever written. And just two years later, John Keats writes the horrific La Belle Dans Sans Merci, and then Lamia and Basil. And what would horror be without Poe? And for that matter, what would detective fiction be without Poe, where in the pages of Graham's magazine readers encountered the first truly modern detective in Inspector Dupin? And what would sci-fi be without Jules Verne? But if we really want to understand how fantasy, detective fiction, science fiction, and horror became Stand alone and well-defined genres in the last century, a tour through the great books just isn't going to do it. What we really want to do is to go here. Which is to a newsstand in November of 1938. Because as far as inspiring, invigorating, and defining each genre, it was three heavily illustrated pulp magazines from the 1920s and 1930s. Black Mask, Weird Tales, and Amazing Stories, where most of the genre birthing happened. And illustrated is a key, because even if what we read now is just text on a page, it was the dynamic interaction between images and texts where the real birthing happened. If you scan through the letters sent in to any of the pulps, most of the correspondence concerns the illustrators. Often, writers were playing catch-up to the visions the illustrators forged. The visual artists didn't just describe in images scenes from the text. They created inspired interpretations that nudged the core aesthetics of sci-fi or romance or crime or horror or fantasy further. And if that sounds abstract, let's get very, very specific and start with the very January 1939 issue of Amazing Stories already on display at this newsstand. It's 1938, and we are not only thick in the world of robots, but have a story that addresses the question of robot consciousness, and a full 11 years before Asimov swiped the title for his landmark work. What about this sea back cover? Here we have something kind of extraordinary. It's 1938, and this amazing futuristic painting by Harold Macaulay. I really want one of those cars. New magnetic science indicates that the day will soon come when rocket trains suspended between supermagnetic rails will flash across the country. Below, they call for a top speed in excess of 500 miles an hour. Now, from the very first issue of Amazing Stories in April of 1926, the masthead read, Extravagant Fiction Today, Cold Fact Tomorrow. And they pretty much were on the mark since the Japanese magnetic bullet train can hit 375. The illustrator of this, Harold McCulley, did a lot of covers for Amazing Stories. Here are two of my favorites where the original artwork has survived. <laughs> 
Amazing Stories was founded in 1926, the masthead. Extravagant fiction today, cold fact tomorrow, the publishers knew exactly what they wanted and what the magazine would become. But early issues were backwards looking, mostly comprised of excerpts of 19th century works by Jules Verne or Edgar Allan Poe or late 19th and very early 20th century work by H.G. Wells. With any new genre, the incorporation of older established works helps energize and give legitimacy to the genre, but the whole impulse of amazing stories was to reach into the future. With the first issue, there's a visual sense of space, of universe out of joint, of nature out of joint. Second, this strange technological forms. Oh no, it's the 50-foot fly and the reanimated head. But the whole slick, high-tech, futuristic feeling is largely absent the first year. Then look what happens. By 1927, you're looking at a whole new genre being born. While some of the text may still be looking backwards, there's an excitement in the illustrations about high-tech future, space travel, and other future marvels, and a dreamy futuristic slickness with all the visual iconography of full-blown science fiction falling into place. The covers are moving in advance of the stories and in a sense educating both audience and writers of the new sci-fi world. Now let's take a look at another pulp. There, right above Argosy, which is a whole other story in its own and which I will tell in a future video, and below the Atlantic and between star sports and real western is a magazine which changed the face of literature. That November 1938 issue of Black Mask on the newsstand proudly proclaims its laurels on the front cover, quote, for 18 years, America's greatest detective story magazine. Those are strong words on a magazine stand with perhaps 50 different crime and detective titles, but it was quite simply the truth. Gertrude Stein loved Black Mask, and Warren G. Harding loved Black Mask, and so did Stan near half the country. Before we had a somewhat detached and hyper-analytic detective after Black Mask, we have the hard-boiled detective walking through a noir world in the mean streets of malice. Dashiell Hammett started writing his continental op stories in the mid-1920s. They were riveting. We never even learn the operative's name, but he is smart, tough, deeply cynical, and willing again and again to walk toward danger, engage with an endless procession of twisted, greed-driven people who are not what they appear, and he figures it out, not by sitting in his armchair, but by walking the city and talking and listening, and we see the world through his eyes. Hammett's scorched face, as my vote, is one of the greatest short stories ever written. There is an urgent modernity to it, a hundred years old. It feels like it could have been written today and engages the most vital themes of our time. And Dashiell Hammett pulls it all off with a tough, pared-down prose that is minimal, gritty, but does the job, and he listens and gets the idioms of American speech just right. It's a dark, twisted, nocturnal world of where the op is constantly looking for the skull beneath the skin, the figure in the carpet, the pattern of human relations and bonding and actions based not upon love but upon greed. You see the world through the operative's eyes. You watch the veils come down. It is film noir decades before there was such a thing. The book version of Red Harvest was published in 1930, but by that time, readers had already seen the op take on an entire corrupt city as it appeared in monthly installments with titles like Poisonville and Dynamite. Of course they brought the book, bought the book, and the images from Black Mask were what they would see as they read it. And Hammett wasn't the only writer. Years before anyone heard of Perry Mason, Earl Stanley Gardner was cranking out incredibly dark mysteries. Paul Kane is fabulous. Raymond Chandler would jump on board too. And the covers, they define noir long before the fact breathe new edgy life into the femme fatale and give an endlessly 
gritty, in-your-face tour of the meanest streets. And the cover art, it is fit to die for. So cover art and illustrations are crucial in defining the whole aesthetic universe of science fiction in the 1920s and 30s in Amazing Stories, and the detective and crime novel takes on its gritty, hard-edged, boiled, dark dance with illustrations in black masks. And that aesthetic impacts every detective novel that comes after. Now, let's pick up another pulp from this 1938 newsstand of treasures. Weird Tales is the crucial source for birthing the modern genres of both horror and fantasy fiction. Its influence is everywhere in our collections of fantasy or horror. I did a prior video on the impact of the Batwoman illustration by Margaret Brundage. On the newsstand is the December 1938 issue with the cover by Ray Quigley. Earth, winter, death, on the altar, bats and vampires, hypnosis. That seems about right for a Weird Tales cover. The lineup is quite something. Robert E. Howard of Conan fame and Robert Block and Seabury Quinn. So far, we've mostly talked about cover illustrations, but it's also the internal illustrations and their interaction with text that help shape the reading and writing habits of generations. So I want to concentrate the rest of the video on the fifth name down, Virgil Finlay, who interprets the Blessed Demoiselle by the Pre-Raphaelite painter and poet Dante Gabriel Rossetti. Virgil Finlay, do you know the name? Before looking at the Rossetti image, here's a quick tour of some of my favorite works of his, both from Weird Tales and elsewhere. Desert of the Damned. Reluctant Eve, illustrating a truly astonishing story by Evelyn Martin that appeared in other worlds. It is perhaps my favorite image related to the whole post-World War II fascination and fear of flying saucers. I find this image deeply moving. Oh, and she is welcoming the dark nighttime powers of bats. And I think the image echoes Goya's The Sleep of Reason Breeds Monsters from centuries earlier, where the man is horrified rather than welcoming of night visions and the unconscious. Her welcoming might just be a credo of weird tales. And again here, Lure the Witch Woman draws strength from all sorts of nighttime creatures. Called Jeering, what a brilliant Shirley Jacksonist lottery-like or Arthur Miller Crucible-esque image of McCarthy-era intolerance of those who don't quite fit. The caption reads, The heartless woman never ceased their jeering and baiting, and it's from Fantastic Magazine in the 50s. And here is my favorite Cold War Space Age image of all, Rocket Ecstasy. I'm going to discuss this in a future video on art of the Cold War. And this fabulous work is one of my favorite mashups of UFO and Cold War anxieties ever. Okay, that is a quick overview of Virgil Finley. So back to our newsstand copy of Black Mask and Finley's illustration of the Rossetti poem. One of Finley's many jobs at Weird Tales was to gather quotes from famous poems or plays from the past that anticipate the emerging genre of modern horror. Finley's role was both brilliant and subtle. Take the quotes and use illustrations to amplify their sense of horror and nudge them towards a Weird Tales aesthetic. The Rossetti poem is about a man who has lost his beloved and imagines in his grief some celestial heavenly reunion. The drastic contrast between her image upon a cloud and the shroud-draped mourner suggests that the union might indeed happen 
but in a much more dreadful way than he imagines. We too will stand beside that shrine, a cult withheld untrod, whose lamps are stirred continually with prayers sent up to God, and see our old prayers granted melt each other like a little cloud. The tonal differences between Rossetti's poem, which is mournful with just a tinge of morbidity, is striking. Finley's version brings out the dark, desolate, grief-besieged undercurrents in the poem, giving us a hell broth of eternal estrangement, the way he brings the Rossetti into line with a weird tale's aesthetic is precisely the point. The poem Finley chooses for the disturbing and grotesque Suicide Chapel cover painted by Margaret Brundage is quite fitting. He takes Longfellow's The Skeleton in the Armor. Speak, speak, thou fearful guest, who with thy hollow chest all in rude armor dressed comest to daunt me. It's a dark poem, but Finley draws the figure of our own death in very close, for the murderous death figure is standing right in front of us and staring us down. Here Finley has both painted the cover and illustrated the poem inside. And ere the tomb throne echoing hath ceased the blue-eyed vampire Sated at her feet, smiles bloodily against the leprous moon. Boy, that's something. I love Finley's illustration. And in this case, the weird horror of the poem pretty much speaks for itself. It's the perfect compliment. Talk about your vampress, who even with mouth dripping blood looks a little bit like a femme fatale. It's the perfect power of bats and mist and graveyard and messy lipstick of dripping blood and femme fatale and moon all interfused. What a fabulous image. It's a Finley cover again, and I have loved Milton all my life, but never did I imagine anything quite this ghoulish until Finley brought it out in it. Hence loathed melancholy of Severus and blackest midnight born in Stygian caves forlorn mongst horrid shapes and shrieks and sights unholy. I love what Finley has done with this. A big and constant point of weird tales is that there have been pockets of horror out there all along. Macbeth, for example, is a hell broth of blood that won't sit in the body and constantly is mixing metaphorically with mother's milk. Like weird tales, Shakespeare is constantly engaging the most primal of fears. But Finley tugs it out even of relatively innocuous places. In Henry IV, you have, I can call spirits from the vasty deep. But Finley gives us spirits that are ghoulish and ferocious and utterly terrifying. This painting is by John William Waterhouse. In the introduction, I mentioned John Keats's poem, La Belle Dans Sans Merci, The Beautiful Woman Without Mercy, is one of the key horror texts of all time. But it's also such an archetypal image of desperately passionate love and almost all the hundreds of illustrations of the poem had focused on the moment when the knight and the young woman meet. Waterhouse is typical of this. You meet a woman and are utterly smitten by her, and then she goes away, and you have intimations of supernatural horror behind her disappearance, and you were warned by ghostly voices that the bell dont sans merci hath the enthrall, thrall means slave, has you in slavery, and the fragrant flowers and comforting river and greenery that a minute before were singing of new life and fecundity and love suddenly become a barren winter wasteland, and the birds are forever silent, and that is why I sojourn here alone and palely loitering 
though the sedge is withered from the lake and no birds sing. It's heartbreaking, but Finley has chosen to focus on the spectral and ghostly part of the poem. I saw pale kings and princes, two pale warriors. Death pale were they all who cried, La belle don sans merci hath the enthrall. I saw their horrid lips in the gloam with horrid warning gaping wide. And that is why I sojourn here on the cold hillside. Finley has drawn the horrors beyond the pale, the ghosts of mind who are not only out there in the forest, but dance darkly through our psyches and souls, through our unconscious minds, our collective unconscious, through mythology, through dreams, through the tale of the tribe. You can banish them, or you can become a bit friendly with them, calling them closer. Weird Tales calls them close, the piteous vestures of the past, silent, mute, reproachful, come home. Maybe in our hearts, but at least in the modern horror section upon our shelves. Okay, that's it. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe. Tomorrow I'm releasing a short, fun little analysis of this fabulous Finley Medusa painting.